Good evening. I'm very proud and happy to uh, introduce uh, the two people that will be speaking tonight. I'll start with Julie, and I'll briefly read uh, a shortened uh, introduction relative to what we had uh, posted in the uh, meeting notice. Julie Snyder has worked in the field of information for 20 years for the past six and a half at Shore Incorporated as a librarian and archivist. Archivist? Ar archivist. Archivist. <clears throat> she holds a Bachelor of Arts in Religion, History, and English from Oberlin College and a Master of Library and Information Science from the University of Pittsburgh. Mr. Michael Patterson, fascinated by music, sound, and audio technology since building a crystal radio set as a lad, Michael Pedersen earned a Bachelor of Arts in Music Theory from the University of Illinois in 1974. Employed by microphone manufacturer Schur Incorporated since 1976, Michael is the Director of Applications Engineering and the Corporate Historian. He is contributing author to the 1550-page reference tome Handbook for Sound Engineers, third edition. He has presented technical white papers to the Audio Engineering Society, National Association of Broadcasters, Acoustical Society of America, National Systems Contractor Association, European Institute of Acoustics, Voice of America, and White House Communications Agency. So with that, I am very uh, happy to present both Michael and Julie for this presentation. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much. So, did you ever see that plaque when you walked in there at the front, the IEEE plaque? So about two years ago, the president of the Shure said to me, uh, I want you to apply for the IEEE Milestone Award. I said, great, what is it? And it turns out that IEEE has this really cool program where they actually go back and they look at and they honor huge presentations to the electrical electronic industry. It goes all the way back to Ben Franklin's work and Marconi and Tesla and uh, Maxwell. And I said, well, you know, that, those are pretty big shoes to fill. Let's see if we could do that. So I started thinking about what we could do. I started to think about the Unidyne microphone and how it's been in production for 75 years. What technical, I can't think of another technical product that's been made for 75 years. Um, and then I started to think about that the uniphase principle, which makes it directional, is pretty much in use in every, almost every directional microphone in the world now. So I said, well, we could do it for that. Getting it was like writing a master's thesis. And what you're going to see tonight is kind of the results of all the research I came up with. The most fascinating aspect was what I learned about Ben Bauer. And I knew the name, but I never really understood what a genius this guy was. And so... In the next, uh, well, it'll be a little bit less than an hour. I hope you'll be able to understand what this guy did for our industry. And then, if you're really good, we have all kinds of really cool stuff from the Sure Archives that we never take out of the building and we've never shown actually to anybody outside of Sure. If you do come up and want to touch something, white gloves or Julie will be all over you. And believe me, you don't want that to happen. <laughs> That's right. All right, so I got to aim it up at you, Travis. Is that correct? All right, I tried that again, and all right, isn't this always the case? Yeah, you just want to advance it for me? Now, of course, of course, another computer is frozen, kids. There we go. All right, this is an ad from 1952. Now, remember, the, the Unidyne was introduced in 1939, and 13 years later. Um, our advertising department was, had a big enough ego to basically put out this ad. Photograph with more celebrities the world over than any other microphone. The microphone that needs no name. Notice there is no logo on that. There is no model number. There was not anything. And the microphone had got so popular that we actually ad, ran an ad like that. And uh, it was actually fairly successful. So, I mean, that's, you know, pretty successful in 13 years. There we go. Thanks. So this is the plaque that's outside. Again, please look at it when you come out. But basically it talks about how we developed this Unidyne microphone and that it offered the first time in a single dynamic element the unidirectional characteristics. Uh, it's milestone number 137. To put this into perspective, I'd like to share with you the other milestones from the 1930s, which are the development of ferrites, the breaking of the German Enigma code, the use of two-way police radio for the first time, 
the Berry computer, one of the first analog computers, the Westinghouse Atom Smasher, and finally voice transmissions from the Antarctic with Admiral Byrd being down there. So that's the company we were keeping. And you know, when they called and said we got that, I did announce it leaping out of my chair and going, yeah! Sorry. <laughs> so how did it become the microphone needs no name? Well, here are some things we can look at. First of all, we got Dewey defeats Truman, the famous uh, photograph there of the Unidyne in the bottom. We have the orator and the Unidyne. This is the famous I had a dream speech that uh, Martin Luther King did in Washington, the Unidyne there. Ah, the singers in the Unidyne, Elvis and the chairman of the board. Of course, some people refer to it as the Elvis microphone because he used it so much. The generals, the admirals in the Unidyne, this is the uh, Japanese surrender on the Missouri. And if you look a little bit, is there a laser pointer on this thing, Travis? Uh, the green one. Hey, thank you very much. Right there is the Unidyne in front of MacArthur. The Unidyne was so associated with Bob Hope that when he died, this actual, this is a uh, uh, Scott Stannis, who's the uh, Chicago Tribune, uh, did this. And so I contacted him and he said, if you send me a Unidyne, I'll send you the original cartoon. So we actually have that original cartoon in our archives. But this is the one that really makes me realize that people love the Unidyne. <laughs> if you do a Google search and you just put in microphone tattoo, you get hundreds of images and they're all the Unidyne. Now, interestingly enough, to my knowledge, no one that works here actually has a Unidyne tattoo. <laughs> <Challenge>. <laughs> But people actually do get tattoos on it. Honestly, I was working at the AES show, and a guy came up, and he had the Unidyne here. And on this bicep, he had the frequency response curve. <laughs> I'm not making that up. I just looked at him, and I just said, wow. <laughs> so when people love a microphone that much to tattoo their body permanently, what, what can you say? It it's really has to be a classic. But. We want to talk about who invented the uniphase principle. That's the acoustical design that's used in the Unidyne microphone. Now, fortunately, anybody that asks me about how the Unidyne microphone or the uniphase actually works, I can't explain it. But Roger and Steve can, so we're going to stick you on him after that if, if we need to. <laughs> Roger says, I'm not sure. And who created this concept when he was just 24 years old? And that is this gentleman here. Benjamin Bauer, who's born Benjamin Baumsweiger, and he was the creator of the Unidyne. This is him in the mid-40s at his office in Schur. The story behind him is amazing. This is what I didn't realize. When I started doing the research, <clears throat> I found a, um, an obituary that was written by a famous acoustician whose name just slipped my mind, but it'll come back to me later. And at the end of it, he talked about having a son, Philip Bauer, who was a dentist in Connecticut, and a son, William Bauer, who, Baumsweiger, excuse me, who was a psychiatrist in Studio City. And through the magic of Google, I found both of them. And they were so thrilled to have a contact with Sure again. As a matter of fact, Philip um, Bauer is the grandson, or the godson, excuse me, of Mr. Sure. That's how close they were. So when I started talking to him, the first conversation was four hours long. And when they came here for the IEEE award, I actually got a two-hour recording of the family history. So I'm going to share some of that family history tonight because it's really ast an astonishing story. So Benjamin Baumsweiger, he's born in 1913 in Odessa in the Ukraine. And it seems like Ukraine always is a, amongst uh, a mid of a war. And even back then, there was a war. And when he was eight years old, the mother packs up Ben and his sister, and they move to Poland because they thought it was going to be better there. And it wasn't better there. As a matter of fact, in Poland at the time, there was a great deal of anti-Semitism. So they were there for a couple of years, and the mother says, that's it, we're out of here. Now, there's a father as well, but I'll explain why he was kind of in the background the entire time. So after two years there, the entire family goes over to London, England. He's at age 12 for a couple of months, and then... Anybody want to get, I got to get asked, I never even knew this. They moved to this uh, part of the world. But anybody guess where the largest Jewish community outside the United States was in the 20s? Any guesses at all? You know? Havana, Cuba. 
Havana, Cuba had a huge community of Jews that came from Europe to escape anti-Semitism. And so Bauer, Baumsweiger's mother, was a concert pianist, and so she sets up a school for teaching piano. And Ben is a, by the way, he's a violinist as well. And they seem pretty happy there. <coughs> well, father Baumsweiger, Playboy, and he also got involved in politics. And he decided to, to back the side that wasn't Batista. And when Batista takes over, he goes after all the guys that back the other side. And so Father Baumsweiger comes to Mrs. Baumsweiger and says, we gotta leave the country. And she says, uh-uh. We went from Ukraine to Poland to England to Cuba. You can leave the country, I'm not. And so he does. Never gets a divorce, goes down to Panama and marries the daughter of the president of Panama. Okay, but never gets divorced from Mama Baumsweiger. So, at age 17, Ben says, I'm gonna get out of Cuba here, I, got, I need to know more. So he moves himself, just himself, at 17 to New York. There is apparently a relative in New York and he attends the New York Electrical School and the Pratt Institute. He gets a two-year degree from them. Moves back at age 19 in 1932 to the, uh, Havana and works for the Geralt Radio Company as a radio service engineer. Probably two-way radio, I guess, because that was, again, that was just coming about at the time period. Age 21, he decides to go to the University of Cincinnati. Why the University of Cincinnati? Well, in the United States, outside of New York at the time, the second largest Jewish community in the United States was in Cincinnati. And he had a relative there. And the University of Cincinnati also had a college of engineering where he could get a double E degree. So for all those reasons, Ben moves there. Now think about this. This guy now has lived in Russia, Poland, Span you know, uh, Cuba, and this is the first country that speaks English. And so he has to teach himself English in a very short period of time. Here he is, the University of Cincinnati. Here's his co-op book score, his class schedule. Notice he does 20 hours of lab time a week. This guy was into it. And you can see, the, I love this, Benjamin Baumsweiger, dorm UC room 403B. Turns at the time that, that Schur had a chief engineer named Ralph Glover. And Ralph Glover was a graduate of the University of Cincinnati. So one day he says to Mr. Schur, you know, Mr. Schur, maybe we could get some co-op students. It's the middle of the Depression. Maybe we could get some co-op students to work here cheaply. Why don't I contact my alma mater? So he writes a letter to uh, G.D. Addison, who was a professor back there. He says, hey, you got anybody down there that looks pretty good? And Addison comes back here and he says, yes, thank you. You know, we've all decided on a junior student as having the qualifications required for your work. His name is Benjamin Baumsweiger. He's made an excellent record at the university. In fact, he is heading this class. So Glover there, and Addison writes back, says, hmm, sounds interesting. What can you tell me about this? So here's Glover writing back, says, thank you for telling us about Benjamin Baumsweiger. Could you give us more information about him? So they exchange some information. And by the way, this is interesting. Look how fast the letters went back and forth here. December 24th, that went from Schur to University of Cincinnati. And December 28th, they're writing back. Don't we wish we had that type of mail service now, right? And finally, a final note from G.T. Edison. So, okay, thank you for the conversation. Here's my introductory letter to Ben Baumsweiger, and he's going to come up and work for you as a co-op student. So if, if uh, Glover hadn't been at University of Cincinnati, grad and hadn't decided to do this, we may not be sitting in this beautiful auditorium. <laughs> a lot of this stuff is serendipity. So at age 23, 1936, he becomes a co-op student working at Sure. He does alternating eight-week periods. Goes to work, goes back to school, goes back to work, goes, and gets a paid a huge salary of $15 a week. At age 24, he graduates, and he's hired by Sure as a development engineer. You guys make, what, $20 a week right now, isn't that, Roger? Yeah, yes, it's, it's, so it's going to come up a little bit now. So who's the man savvy enough to hire him at $15 a week? And that would be our founder, S.N. Schur, sitting right over the, at the time. So here it is, folks. Further work on the unidirectional dynamic microphone in July 38. This is the earliest document that we can find which actually shows the uniphase principle. Uh, typewritten by Ben, and also these drawings are hand drawings by him as well. Um, 
again, you can ask Roger and the guys what this equ all these equations mean up here. But this is the earliest thing that we can find anywhere about what the actual work is that he did. And there's actually his uh, cir equivalent circuit up here. And math, that is completely beyond me. But it's kind of cool just to see the actual document that he probably gave to Glover and to Mr. Shearer saying, look at this. This works pretty cool. <clears throat> okay. When we're done with this, you're going to come down here and hidden underneath here is something that Julie and I uncovered. You have a loud voice. Why don't you just tell them just briefly about how this happened, how we came upon the prototypes. Um, there was a, a box in the archives. It was a uh, broken down box. The glass was gone. It was wrapped in saran wrap, and it was just something that was in the collection, and we weren't quite sure what it was. During the research process for the IEEE milestone award, we remembered that box and thought that maybe that this box relates to this project somehow. Do you notice there are some photos lining the hallway when you first came in? One of those black and white photos is of a woman giving a tour to new hires. We look at this photo and say, you know, the box in that photo looks an awful lot like the box that we found in the archive. So we went to a little Scooby-Doo on the photo, pulled out the magnifying glass to try to figure out what was in it. And sure enough, this photo that was taken in our downtown Chicago office where the company was founded is of this item that we found in the archives. We think what happened was when we moved, we took the box off the wall and we put it in storage. And it never made it out of storage until now. So we had, to, so <clears throat> when we got that, I asked uh, the president here, can I take it home for a month? Myself and my neighbor worked on it for about 80 hours, restoring the glass, restoring the actual wood, and putting all of the prototype elements back in there. So really for the first time outside of Sure, you're going to see pr these prototypes here and you're actually going to see them after you come up and take a look at them. So this is the first working uh, Unidyne prototype. Now it really should rephrase this. It's really the first working uniphase prototype. Again, the uniphase is the acoustical principle that makes the m a single element um, microphone directional. And the reason I know this is not a Unidyne is because I took a paper clip and I tried to find a magnet anywhere on that, and there's nothing that's magnetic. So it's very likely that it actually was a crystal element inside there. We'd have to take it apart to find it, and we're not willing to do that. I think you can appreciate that. So here's prototype number one and prototype number two. You can see that this certainly looks more like what a microphone element would look like. And again, there's nothing magnetic on that. I've taken the paper clip, and I can find nothing anywhere that makes it magnetic. So it's probably a crystal element. As a matter of fact, this probably was designed to fit into our round uniplex microphone body. We've got one up here you can see when we're done with the talk. This is the most fascinating one. Now there is missing here a diaphragm. You can see here where the voice coil goes in and there should have been an aluminum diaphragm over there as well, that's gone. But what he did was, <coughs> it's, it was hard to, if you wanted to vary the magnetic flux, kind of hard to put different permanent magnets in and out. So what he did was he made an electromagnet here. And he made the electromagnet so he could vary the flux strength and figure out what worked the best. Also you can't tell is that there's a space, an acoustical space that's behind the actual diaphragm and he could vary the length of that by a screw. This here is a knurled screw and he could pull that in and out. So I'm sure he experimented around with it until it sounded good, and then once it sounded good, he goes, okay, that's the flux strength, here's the acoustical space we've got to have, and then he made this, which looks kind of like a microphone. And as a matter of fact, this is magnetic. You can take a paper clip and it will co come right to that. Why did he make it a triangle? I don't know. Maybe because it's just a simple shape, not too certain. So there's prototype number four. <clears throat> Here's prototype number five, which also is circular because it would fit into our uniplex microphone body. You'll see that later. But you notice the springs. Ah, shock mounting. And cotton in there, so those springs are going boing every time you touch the microphone, right? Now we're getting closer. So here's five and six, and now we're getting close to something that actually looks like the final Unidyne cartridge itself. Here's six, and that's the actual cartridge as it went into the Unidyne itself. That's version seven and the final version that was used in the, in the large Unidyne microphone. So here it is, Unidyne element number 1939, and we have them all underneath here. You can take a look at them later. There, we, we will have the glass between you, so if you sneeze on them, they won't catch cold or anything like that. So it went from prototype. This is the actual wooden prototype <coughs> carved around 1938. 
We found this underneath the anechoic chamber in our Evanston building. When we were moving over here, we were looking every nook and cranny, and somebody pulls out this old box and says, what the heck's this? And we open it up, and it's got a little note in there. It says, carved, you know, wooden prototype, original Unidyne microphone. That is up here as well. You'll be able to see that. We had some microphone collectors come through our archives many years ago, and I showed it to the guy. said, $5,000 right now. I got it in my pocket. You can have it. And we said, no, this is, this, this is not going anywhere. So we went from prototype to production in two years. Pretty amazing. But what the thing that was asking the, our president here, Mr. Lamantias, Sandy says to me, okay, we know about Bauer, but who designed the look of the microphone? That's what everybody remembers, right? And I couldn't find any information about that, but I had a conversation, oh, 15 years ago when I was doing the Sure History book with a guy named Jack Berman, who Bob will remember probably. Jack Berman worked here in the 30s and the 40s and the 50s, and he said to me, you know, I seem to remember that we based the look of that microphone on a car grill, a 1937 car grill, but I can't remember what it was. Well, with the help, help of Google Images, we found... 1937 Oldsmobile. <laughs> Carrie's got an open. <laughs> You think that might have influenced the microphone look? I think probably it did. So my answer to our president was, who designed the look of the Unidyne? It was General Motors. <laughs> this here is the original Unidyne introductory letter, mailed out March 11, 1939 to all sure dealers. It was $45 in 1939, that's the equivalent of $760 in 2014. Um, our current unit nine, which we make now, is around $299, so it actually it's gone down in, in cost. Here's my favorite ad. I love this. This is bespeaks 1940, doesn't it? Goodbye feedback. This is the, oops, sorry, this is the Uniplex microphone here. This is, has the Uniphase principle, but it's a crystal element. And of course, this is the unit nine with the dynamic element. We've got both of those here. We'll show them to you later. This faded away very quickly because of you know crystal microphones. The crystal would absorb mo moisture, and the salt crystal would eventually would dissolve. So it basically lost favor fairly quickly. Here's the patent: conversion of wave motion into electrical energy. Let's call that a really big patent. <laughs> he cast a wide net on this. If you're interested in looking it up, there's the model, number, there's the patent number. You can get that off. So if, you, you know, if you're interested in that, write that number down and, and take a look at it. Um, some beautiful drawings from the patent. There's, there's that same, excuse me, there's that same electrical circuit that we saw in the typewritten one before. And here's the actual cartridge itself, front end. And, th and this is, what, by the way, an aluminum diaphragm. And then the first white paper that came out had to wait for the patent to clear was in the Journal of the Acoustical Society of America, 1941, and it's called, oh, sorry, I keep pressing the wrong button, the uh, Uniphase Unidirectional Microphone by Benjamin Bauer. He was Baumswager when he started, he became Bauer within 1940-41. Uh, Why did that happen? Sure got, uh, in 1941, the US government came to us and said, we want you to start making uh, microphones for the military. And so Sure went from about 200 people to 2,000 people in less than a year. 24 hours a day, seven days a week, making microphones. Mr. Schur went to the people that had particularly unusual and foreign sounding names and said, if you would please change your name. He didn't order them to, but he asked them to change it. And so it went from Baumswiger to Bauer, and that's where the change came. So the original patent was under Baumswiger, and it basically became Bauer after that. Uh, and there's actually the second, last page of it, and of course you can see the cardioid pattern that we're all familiar with. Interesting here, the author wishes to express his gracious to the Professor C.P. Boner of the University of Texas. Those of you who know the consulting firm knows the Boner and Associates down in Austin, Texas have been around for years, so I thought this is kind of interesting. So after 20 years here, became the Vice President of Engineering, but Bauer left sure to join CBS Labs in Connecticut. Only recently did I figure out why. He was an inventor. His kids said that he would come home from work at Sure have a meal, sleep for about four hours, get up at, at midnight and work through the entire day. He basically needed four hours of sleep and he loved to invent. If you become the vice president of engineering in a company this size, what do you do? Paperwork. You defend patents, you do paperwork, you, you hire people, you do not become, an, you're no longer an inventor. And I'm certain that Ben Bauer just got fed up with it. 
And so he had worked with CBS Labs to develop the M3D stereo cartridge because in 1958, CBS brought out the first stereo LP and they needed a way to play it. And they'd been working secretly with Sure to develop the M3D cartridge. It was via that that CBS Labs learned of Ben Bauer, how bright he was, and William Paley, owner of CBS, offered him a job, saying, I'm gonna open up CBS laboratories in Connecticut. You come from work for me, all you gotta do is invent. So he left, after 20 years at Sure, he left and worked for Paley for 20 years at CBS Labs. In uh, 1978, he retired at 65 because he had to retire unless you're William S. Paley. So he retired at 65. He had over 100 patents to his name. And then a year later, uh, March 31st, he died of a heart attack. I talked to his, his sons and I said, what do you think he was most proud of? Was he most proud of the Unidyne? Was he most proud of his work with stereo, quadraphonic, whatever? And, he said, and they said, no. He did a lot of work for the government and he felt his biggest contribution was the development of the Sano Boys. Sano Boys are things that you drop in the ocean and they allow you to track submarines. And during the Cold War in particular, the US had very, very advanced Sano Boys that many of them that Bauer helped develop. And the US, United States government let the USSR know that we know where your submarines are at. And because of that, if you decide to attack us, we will decide to attack you. And so Bauer always felt that he was, you know, partially responsible, and not in an egotistical way, of keeping that stalemate during the Cold War, particularly with the nuclear submarines. So he felt that his work on the sound of buoys was the most important thing he's done. And by the way, much, much, of, much of his work is still classified. Okay, anybody here 21 years old or less? I don't think so. All right, so since none of you are born after September 30th, 1993, you can stay in the room because we're gonna show you some very uncensored and revealing photos of Unidyne microphones. Some of them without their tops. I'm sorry I had to say this, but it's, it's true. Here's a Unidyne one from uh, model 55 from 1939. That's actually the one that's inside this case you'll see here. Here's the logo, which we still use, which is very, it's a cool logo. Here's the airwaves, here's a sine wave or an S for sure, and here's the coil on the other side. So it's just a, a logo that we have used and we now use on, on all our KSM microphones, our high-end condenser mics. Here's a model Unidyne 1556. It was basically a 55 with a shock mount at the bottom. Nothing different than that. Here's one we have. We actually have this, right? The, we have the, can you remember the story of this? Can you give a quick version of the story of it? Yeah, so we didn't add, and we have that microphone here tonight. Take a look at it. Here's the Unidyne 2, model 55S. All right, you've always wanted to know, what does the S stand for? It stands for small. And television came about, and the original 55 was too big, and so we made it smaller so it wouldn't cover as much the face of the people when they were on television. You also notice the color of the cloth. It was a blue it wasn't, it wasn't really a silk, it was really a blue cloth of some sort. Bob probably knows the actual type of cloth. But we used to go down to um, uh, Vogue Fabric, right? There. Vogue Fabric in Evanston with a little device that would measure the acoustical impedance of cloth, and we would buy the cloth that had the acoustical impedance we want. We, there was a mystery that we had, we recently figured out, was that we went back and we didn't have color photos of the Unit 9, but never in the actual description of it did this say what color the cloth was. And I found things that were black and red and blue, and eventually it dawned upon me, we used whatever we could buy. <laughs> <laughs> and so when guys call me up and say, hey, I'm trying to restore my Unit 9 microphone, what color was the cloth? We go, I don't know, <laughs> it's whatever we get. So th this blue was used for a long time, but there are also versions that had red in it as well, and red that kind of turned to brown over yeah, a little maroon over time. Here's the difference between the Unidyne 2, the small, and the Unidyne 1. On the right, gives you an idea of the size difference. And here's some of those revealing photos I promised you. This is the insides of the Unidyne 1. You can see the transformers are there. Diaphragm's about the same size. 
Uh, my guess is one of the ways they reduced it is maybe the acoustical uh, network and back got changed slightly and perhaps the magnet was stronger in, in a smaller amount. I really don't know the details on that. Here's a Unidyne 2 model 55SW. What does the W stand for? Switch. We added a switch. That was all it was. Then we got some bling. <laughs> Got the, got the gold one from uh, 1967, and boy, did that reflect the lights when it was on TV. Whoa, blinding. Then we changed from the Amphenol connector to the XLR connector. Okay, how many of you old enough to remember the Amphenol connector? Yeah, right? Wasn't a bad connector, except it didn't, quick, it didn't connect, uh, disconnect quickly. You had to unscrew it and so forth. But, so 78, we changed from the Amphenol to the um, three pin. Then we changed to a different capsule in 1989. This is called the 55SH Series 2. That's what it looks like inside there. And then in uh, 2009, we brought out the Super 55, which is basically, and notice the blue, by the way, it's blue foam this time, but it's blue because we went back to the original 1951 version. And that's kind of got a, uh, the kind of the equivalent of a Beta 58 cartridge. Not exactly the same, but based upon that. And that's what it looks like inside itself. And then this one here, which was limited edition, sold out immediately, and you can buy them on eBay for three times the price that we sold them originally. We should have done that really from the street. So it gives you kind of an idea. So 19, here it is, 2014, 75 years, and we're still making these things. Now, this is the Audio Engineering Society. You probably want to hear a little bit of audio. So the first track we're going to let you hear is Ben Bauer speaking. Now, I didn't know exactly what to think, but the thing is, see, so he's Russian, Spanish, American, it's got to be an unusual accent. And it is a l an unusual accent and a little bit of an unusual voice. So uh, we've got about a one minute track here to let you hear Ben. Go ahead, Travis. Maybe not. Came out in the Journal of the Audio Engineering Society is because when I was in, in Zurich, Switzerland, attending a meeting of the Audio Engineering Society in the spring of this year, uh, I realized how popular is in Europe what the Germans call the Kunstkopf stereophony. And this means the art of listening using earphones to broadcasts which are made with a dummy head with microphones in place of the ears. We have we have demonstrated this by actually coming in on one of our shows here, Ben, and using the dummy head instead of the regular studio microphone. Oh, did you really? Right. It's a, it's a very effective method, and while it does not compare with a true quadraphonic program using four loudspeaker, it does provide a very effective... Very uh, spacious Spacious sound. feel. Right. Yeah. And I would have expected... <laughs> <laughs> Very in interesting accent, isn't it? It's, it sounds like a little bit of Latin and a little bit French. Hard to tell what it is. So the other thing we did, <coughs> and I tried to find recordings of this and couldn't find it. We decided to make a recording of every Unidyne cartridge that we had. A 1939 50, 55, a 1951-55S, uh, an 89 Super 55, or excuse me, Series 2, and the 2009 Super 55. So now you're going to hear four recordings, all made at the same time, I mean all made the same day, same talker, same space. The only difference is the microphones. So let's start out with uh, audio track number two, please, Travis. This is the Unidyne Model 55 from 1939. In 1939, Shure introduced the Unidyne microphone. Employing the uniphase acoustical system, the patented Unidyne was the first microphone to provide directional characteristics using a single dynamic element. This is the Unidyne Model 55S from 1951. In 1939, Schur introduced the Unidyne microphone. Employing the uniphase acoustical system, the patented Unidyne was the first microphone to provide directional characteristics using a single dynamic element. This is the Unidyne Model 55SH Series 2 from 1989. In 1939, Schur introduced the Unidyne microphone. Employing the uniphase acoustical system, the patented Unidyne was the first microphone to provide directional characteristics using a single dynamic element. This is the Unidyne model Super 55 from 2009. In 1939, Schur introduced the Unidyne microphone. 
employing the uniphase acoustical system, the patented Unidyne was the first microphone to provide directional characteristics using a single dynamic element. Doesn't sound too bad for a 1939 microphone, does it? Now let's do this. Now we're just going to do, we're going to shorten it up, and now we're going to go from new back to old. And that's track three. So it's just going to be like a much shorter, but it'll give you an idea and be able, be able to compare the differences. Travis, thanks. This is the Unidyne model Super 55 from 2009. This is the Unidyne model 55SH Series 2 from 1989. This is the Unidyne model 55S from 1951. This is the Unidyne model 55 from 1939. Not bad. Not bad. We were a little surprised. And we started thinking about how do we hear microphones from the 39? Well, you hear it through crappy media. You hear it from scratchy 78 records. You hear it from bad. That's what the microphone sounded like right off it. So, you know, you can imagine the first time that Mr. Schur heard that in 1939. He said, wow, this 24-year-old kid, first patent ever, changed the entire world, has really got something. So, still being manufactured after 75 years of introduction, we still think it continues to be the microphone that needs no name. Now, what I'd like to do before we open, take off the lights, answer any questions for you, happy to do that. If not, we're going to take these covers off and invite you to come down and look at all these artifacts that we've got. Yes? I, I, I can't tell from the graphs. I mean, these are just, you know, we don't know how the microphones have changed over the years. Um, so it's a good question. I don't know. But the, Bob, Bob might have a comment. Yeah. That's the SM57 and 58. Yeah, what's that? The three went Into the Super 55 or something similar to it. It's based upon a Unidyne 3, yes. Yeah. So we don't know how the microphones have changed over the years. I mean, they have. But I just know that the first time we hooked up that, that 1939 55, we said, hmm, sounds pretty good. It was also the first one we pulled off the shelf in the archives. And Happened to work. Yeah. Yes, Bob. What do you think, Roger and or Steve? The, the diaphragms don't move that much. You think they change that much? Yeah. I don't know. I've never, I know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You have a comment? Either way. It could change either. Yeah. Right. Uh, did you run this No, we didn't. We, we, we probably could. We just we just didn't do that. Yeah, but we we, th we thought that the oral oral demonstration was probably pretty cool. <laughs> you know, rather than just listening at a gr at a graph here here what it really it sounds like. Uh, Sandy Lamontier, our president, was so so impressed with it they decided to use that 1939 for a recent speech. <laughs> He, just he said, I can't believe it sounded that good. I said, yeah, it did sound that good. Any other questions? If not, I would like you to invite you to come down and take a look at these cool artifacts because I can guarantee you, you're never going to see them again. <laughs> and if you do want to touch, we've got to put gloves on you. That's the end of this, the formal presentation. Hope you enjoyed it. Come down and take a look.